Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the second part of my series on machine learning. Uh, in the first part, if you remember around a month back, we covered the declarative layers, the basic ecosystem that machine learning operates in. Uh, and a lot of you reached out and you asked, okay, what about the applicative layer? What about the second part? Mm -hmm. So this video, this uh, presentation basically covers the applicative layers in the machine learning. Basically, after you have set up the tooling, how do you go ahead and identify use cases, target use cases, and what is the team structure that goes ahead with it? Firstly, uh, basic about me, uh, Sanjit here. I've done my BE from NSIT Delhi and my MBA from ISB Hyderabad. I have around five years of software development experience. Post that, which I did my MBA. And after that, I've had around 10 years of product experience, basically mostly uh, platform product experience across the spectrum. So I've worked across Africa, in India, uh, in Europe, and even in the US. And unofficially, I am accidental an MBA. And of course, what what is an accidental MBA does who wants to reclaim his tech roots, he gravitates towards platform PM roles. That's what me um, I am all about here. So why are we here? Three points. To again give Kyan commiserate on our lockdown lines, even though it's getting better, but uh, my friends in the UK can attest to the fact that a new variant is out. So if you are UK, uh, please stay safe. And yes, as we discussed, to complete the MS story. So th what we discussed last time was only the first part of the story, but today we aim to complete the uh, full story. So maybe uh, let's go through the reminder of what we discussed last time, especially from a terminology point of view. Uh, the biggest superset that we discuss right now is artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? It's basically a sentient being, right? Somebody who is non-carbon based like us, but can actually think, sense, reason, basically which can pass Kurzweil's uh, double blind test is something that we'll call a artificial intelligence system. Uh, machine learning is a subset of that. Basically a learning system that learns and adapts on a very specific area over multiple iterations, right? Uh, basically like a kid, right? You learn and adapt a lot of times. You just do a lot of, you uh, basically, if I can take a very real life example, it's something like AlphaGo. This is a deep mind system, which plays against itself and learns and uh, to learns and adapt to play the game of Go, which is a 19 cross 19 board game. Right? And deep learning is even a smaller sector of machine learning, which is basically multiple neural networks just learning about themselves. In the industry, what you will see is machine learning and deep learning are used very interchangeably. So for all intents and purposes in the tech industry, uh, we will use machine learning as a tool. And again, <clears throat> this is what we discussed last time from an ecosystem point of view. On the leftmost part, we have the data formative layer which is where all your individual data sources within the org are actually generated, right? Right after that is the data aggregation layer. So once let's say you have data sources which are aggregated, and what kind of data sources you can have? Marketing, order, identity, et cetera, et cetera, within your org. Uh, they are aggregated somewhere, most likely something like a, a data lake or a data warehouse, right? This is called the data aggregation layer. The data aggregation layer feeds into something that we call as a declarative layer the machine learning tools there, which is actually enables this data to be used by machine learning models in the future. This is a very important part of the data because you cannot just feed crap data to your machine learning model. The, the kind of data you feed in is the kind of output you will get. So everything within this is counted as a part, uh, as a very viable part in the machine learning ecosystem. The declarative layer then feeds into the applicative layer which is something that we are going to discuss in deep detail here today. What does applicative layer do? Basically, once you have the tools ready, once you have the input data ready, you actually have to identify opportunity, identify applications, and actually work on deploying and actually getting those results that we are all buying for via machine learning deployment. And what you see at the bottom is a observability layer, because anything and everything that you do in a tech system should be observable, should be monitorable. And uh, again, as we discussed, if you remember last time, if you don't, please go back to the video. That video is still available on Product School's website. And uh, what happens is there can be a singular observability layer all across, 
but there are dedicated tools that actually work on machine learning observability as well. In fact, it's a very hot area right now. Right. So this is what we discussed last time. Uh, building upon this foundation, we will actually go into the last part of the ecosystem, which is a machine learning applicative layer. Okay, we already discussed this. Data formative layer is a production of data. Aggregation representation is a collection of all big data sets in one place. Basically, it has it's just a very simplistic explanation. You have cataloging of data, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Declarative layer is a tooling for the applications of workflows, and finally the applicative layer that we are going to discuss today. Uh, going further, we are assuming that we have well-labeled data. It's an industry term used in machine learning, as we discussed last time. Uh, data with proper data lineage and tooling is not a blocker for our rollouts. So going further, we are assuming everything is in place before data applicative layer, and we are all set to actually roll out our machine learning applications. Now, let's come to the machine learning ecosystems application layer. So application layer, I'm going to further break down into three parts, right? The first one is identification of the problem. Okay, it's all well and good to say, okay, we are going to use machine learning. Machine learning is going to be a game changer for my e-commerce website. But how do you actually identify what kind of use cases can be solved viably and gainfully by machine learning? And what kind of use cases are better than by a human? Let's say the human element is still not big. Not, you're not going to, this is not Skynet, right? We're not going to replace humans, right? So basically, we are trying to narrow down what problems need to be sorted by ML, right? Who actually drives this? It's PM along with ML practitioners. So mostly what you will see is data scientists within your org, within your product groups, who are embedded within your uh, as a data scientist craft, who are actually going to drive this. And they do it via three ways. So there are three ways you can actually identify machine learning use cases, and it depends on the kind of organization you are, the kind of maturity you have in the machine learning use case. <clears throat> First one, and the most common one is C. So I will start with C and work my way through B and A. Uh, if you are a young startup, right, and you don't have a dedicated machine learning craft to your system, you don't have an experimental layer set up for you, it's very difficult for you to actually go ahead and try machine learning, right? So what you do is, we actually hire an external consultant, sometimes who can actually be a machine learning consultant. Mostly somebody who has worked in a big org who actually knows, OK, the ropes of actually identifying a big uh, a machine learning use case. And you hire that person to teach you the ropes, to teach you, OK, how do you identify machine learning use cases? And what you do is you use a lot of third party tools to actually do a pilot test case. And if it adds value to you from a revenue point of view, you actually look to invest further. So C is mostly used by startups a lot. Then we come to B, which is have a central MPAR team which finds use cases. Let's say a central machine learning kind of a team, which actually goes out and delves deeper into each product group and finds use cases for you. There are pros and cons for both. Uh, mostly this is done by mid to large organizations. Mid organizations are much more beneficial having a centralized team because there's no longer spread. So let's say, uh, if you are, let's say, a $100 billion, $100 million organization, which is, let's say, a 200 people tech team, a SaaS organization, it's easy to span the scope of the use cases that can be available by a centralized team. So this is mostly done by a mid-tier team, right? It's very difficult in a large team, let's say, a 2,000 or, sorry, 5,000 people plus organization, having a central team would be very difficult for you to actually go and dive deeper into individual use cases of each product group. So as we discussed, B is mostly used by mid-tier organization. And A is something that you will find a lot done by a large organization. Let's say a Fortune 200 or Fortune 100 organization. What they try to do is they have ML practitioners which are embedded within each product group. So I'm sure within your product or organization, you have horizontal and vertical product groups, which is platforms and consumer-facing product groups. So ML practitioners are embedded within the vertical product group. And at the same time, you also have a central team. So I'm not saying it's either or. A lot of organizations do A and B mix, right? So it gives you the best advantage of having a central log as well as having a distributed log. So this is basically what we are trying to do. OK, you identify problems at this area. And how data scientists identify problems is, OK, via statistic variance, by testing out, OK, this is one use case that we have, which is uh, being done by a human or being not done very properly. But if we can maybe automate this, this is the amount of revenue we can save. Et cetera, et cetera. So it all starts like your basic experimentation deployment 
with a value case, with, with a statement of purpose that, okay, if A, then B. Cool. So let's move to the second part, problem implementation, right? So once a viable use case is selected, as we discussed in the first uh, part of our presentation, uh, then it's up upon us, let like upon the machine learning team to actually go ahead and implement a viable model. What you do is, and uh, please remember the assumption I called out that the data we have is well labeled, it is non biased data. Right? Now you're going ahead and building a model. And this is where there are a lot of TensorFlow, a lot of build model building tools, etc., come into the picture, where you're actually sitting down and asking your machine learning practitioners to come up with a model. Right? A model that is self learning, right? Once you have the model, you feed it label data and you feed it by the billions, right? You let's say feed 5 billion data points, 6 billion data points. It's actually uh, a science behind this, how you go ahead it. And that's why you need machine learning tools, the declarative layer, right? And once you feed the data, you are actually observe, right? You have your machine learning uh, practitioners who are observing, okay, uh, how much is the variance, right? We are feeding the data. But when is the, let's say, model 80% ready, 90% ready, 99% ready, right? Uh, these kind of things can be outsourced by a highly specialized and imparting can be done centrally by a highly specialized team as well. Uh, in the previous example, when we discuss a central machine learning team, if you have a central machine learning team, this is mostly what they are trying to do. Right? This includes building new learning models. So, uh, Besides uh, a lot of models that are available online right now, right? Let's say personalization or a lot of these standard vanilla use cases, the bare basic model is available online. But for each of our organization, the model has to be modified. So this team basically what it does is at this stage, it modifies that model, right? But all those models are still based on very standard learning methods that we have in the industry, which is regression, binary, multi-class classification, clustering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what you will find is increasingly a lot of new organizations are bringing in new learning methods. So this this ecosystem increasingly becomes a, a center of excellence. You will have a lot of PSG involved here, a lot of scientists or researchers who are actually going coming and trying to prove their hypothesis. So a very rich area, but frankly, not much to do for a PM here. Cool. So now we have a model ready, we have fed it data, and now we are relatively confident that that model is ready to actually go live, actually see, okay, how much it does on live production traffic. Now you get into impact assessment. Once a model is built and cleared for live deployment, you assess that this is a viable use case for production deployment, you deploy it, and what do you, how do you deploy it? You deploy via specific experimentation infra, right? You want to see, observe efficacy of the product. One very important differentiation that you see, and it's maybe a, a shortcoming of the current experimentation tool. Once you are trying to deploy a machine learning model, you're trying to deploy a multivariate model. It's not a single variable or twice variable, right? It's multivariate. So you need a very specific set kind of a experimentation infra. And this experimentation infra, once let's say you have run the test for a certain amount of time, then the reports, then the like any outcome of the experimentation tool have to be peer reviewed. You have to take everything with a salt. Only when you find a dedicated uh, p-value negative less than 0 0.05 and impact that is very specific and measurable, can you actually go ahead and uh, let's say disseminate this information to say, okay, this is what my model brought into information. I think this is a value add, right? Again, as we discussed, this part can be outsourced or can be done by a highly specific and our team as well. Right. But this is a very important part of the rule, right? Uh, a lot of teams uh, in the industry do one and two very well. One and two is standard deployment, right? Your developers or machine learning practitioners can do it. But being very thorough, being very dispassionate about three, the point three that we discussed here, is something that is not done well in the industry. Especially once after the practitioners have spent a lot of time one, one and two, right? There's a lot of recency bias that keeps the picture. People say, no, no, this model is working fine. This data is not doing well, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So a very, a very impartial, a very empowered team has to sit here, which is empowered to okay, okay, say, okay, scrap it. This model is not working. Only then would you see value in having a machine learning person, or it's, it's as good as spending a development hours. 
Cool. So maybe we can discuss a few use cases. Let's say um, you see a lot of no coding, automated transaction part of coding. Um, I am a big fan of DeepMind. So maybe go and uh, read their website, right? Basically, they have come up with a, a, a automation tool, a machine learning model, which can actually enable no coding. Right? Somebody, uh, let's say a machine, who can do a certain amount of transactional part of coding better than a human, better than 50% of the humans, right? So they actually came up with a model that are actually doing competitive coding better than 50% of humans, which is automated. This is awesome, right? Just imagine in the future, right? Uh, if most of the coding practices that a developer do, 70% of it is just uh, house cleaning. If let's say we can automate house cleaning by a software, how impactful a software engineer would be, right? Uh, second one is automation of RTFM. Read the effing manual, right? Uh, let's say in a help center kind of environment, right? You have uh, tons of help center documents, but you want to prioritize the document that you see mostly people are struggling with. So automatically hire credence to more user support articles is also a very nice use case, and there are so on and so forth. Uh, the kind of industry application for machine learning are endless. You see vision based, you see automation, the tooling, etc. Et in, in biology, uh, so again, defaulting to deep mind, the kind of work they are doing is simply amazing. Then, uh, again, this is something that I have spending a dedicated slide on because I don't want either of us to forget about this. Machine learning ecosystem is nothing without its monitoring and observability there. Monitoring and observability becomes all the more important so that the machine learning output is not yiki. That's a term that's used a lot by us. Right? And concerted effort should be put here. So if I can, let's say, if you're spending 80% of your time getting your machine learning model ready, I would spend another 80% of your time just making sure your monitoring is correct. Because what you see is what you get. Right? If you're not even able to measure and observe what you are looking to deploy, right? it's as good as a black box. So what are some of the trend lines that we discussed today? Firstly, the strong trend lines. Applicative layer is vast and humongous, touching everything under the sun. Right? Uh, I'm a big component of machine learning. I think it's going nowhere. It's only going to get better and better. The kind of application we can think, we can't even think the machine learning uh, ecosystem is going to solve is is beyond uh, beyond reproach, right? Uh, life sciences, self-driving cars, vision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, data ecosystem is a benchmark. So all what we are assuming, everything that is done in a machine learning ecosystem cannot be done without data ecosystem. Without you having the initial four layers or three layers that we discussed, without that having in place, you are not going to get anything done by the last layer. So as much importance should be given to those four layers as we are looking at the result layer, right? And as we discussed last time around as well, I don't see much to be done by a PM and applicator there. A PM drives a lot in tooling and products, right? So you will see a lot of strong PM growth in machine learning in the ML platform layer, ML tooling layer, or data science layer. So that is where you enable uh, these uh, use cases to happen. You will see a lot of research driven in applicator layer. Of course, uh, dare you to be proven wrong and dare to be convinced otherwise, I'm always a LinkedIn pink away. So answer is always statistically variant. And that's me. I hope I didn't give you another death by PowerPoint. And uh, if you have any concerns, any issues, you can always reach out. I'm available on LinkedIn. And thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Cheers.